Next up in our uh, discussion of data science ethics, I want to touch on data privacy. And I'm going to start with a pretty old case study, AOL search data le leak. And the reason why I'm starting uh, with this more almost historical study at this point is that one, these issues around data privacy have been around for a long time. So this is not necessarily a new thing and somehow we don't seem to be getting much better at it. And number two, uh, data from this is still available on the web. So um, as you are finding yourselves looking for various data sources, either as part of this course, but also going into the future in terms of things to uh, practice your data science skills with or actually do uh, further research with, um, you really want to be very critical of where your data is coming from and whether it was sourced ethically in a way, right? So the AOL search data leak um, happened uh, back in 2006. And here I have a story from the New York Times uh, where they did a kind of an uh, expose of the uh, situation, but they specifically highlighted uh, one of the users who agreed to be identified as part of this story. This is Miss Thelma Arnold, and she was an um, elderly woman, and her AOL searcher number is there on the screen. So uh, with the data leak, um, the names weren't necessarily leaked, but it was, um, you know, it was unfortunately quite straightforward with a little bit of digging to identify who these people were. So in fact, the New York Times reporters were able to identify her and then interviewed her and then um, asked if she would be, agree to be part of this story. And I want to read one quote from this uh, where she says she was shocked to hear that AOL had saved and published three months worth of her search results. So. Uh, perhaps to you, it may not seem so, um, you know, unbelievable that when you are doing searches, say Google searches or something like that, that this information is being saved somewhere. I think we're a little bit more aware of the fact that this sort of data is being saved. And, you know, oftentimes we're told that it's being saved to help us better. And in fact, it does. Once you search for one thing and you click on a result, the next time you search for something relevant, Google is pretty good at, um, you know, putting uh, search results that may be more relevant to you. But the um, pervasiveness of how this data is being used um, all over the internet and kind of how it tracks you is probably something a little more um, kind of opaque to us. But she said, my goodness, it's my whole personal life. I had no idea somebody was looking over my shoulder. So in this case, uh, given that this has happened uh, many years ago, um, Perhaps many members of the society did not realize that this sort of information is saved and then can be released about them and then can be used to identify them. Perhaps we know a little bit more about the fact that this sort of information is being saved about us, but I think oftentimes we don't necessarily think about, one, what would happen if it was somehow released and we could be identified, and number two, how else is that information being used even if it's not being uh, publicly distributed? Who is it being distributed to? How does it follow us around the internet? This sort of stuff um, is often on those uh, fine prints when you land on a web page, those giant GDPR notices, and they're there for a reason and they're there for protection. But I think many of us just find ourselves saying, all right, fine, just I'm gonna click okay so I can actually read this article that I wanted to read. Um, another example is one we briefly touched on last week when we were talking about web scraping, which is the OkCupid okay case study. So in 2016, researchers published data of 70,000 OkCupid okay users, including usernames, political leanings, drug usage, and intimate sexual details. So these are all things people had given up themselves as part of their OkCupid okay profile. Um, and researchers didn't release the real names and pictures of OkCupid okay users, but their identities could easily be uncovered, critics uh, pointed out, from the details provided. And sometimes that detail is simply their username because people tend to use their real name as their username or use the same username across other platforms as well, where perhaps in some of them, uh, their real name is attached to the, uh, their username. Um, here is a quote from the researchers who released the data. They said, some may object to the ethics of gathering and releasing this data. However, all the data found in the data set are or were already publicly available. So releasing this data set merely presents it in a more useful form. 
Well, first of all, one wonder is useful for whom exactly. And the other thing is that when the users um, gave up this information about themselves, they gave it up um, thinking that the information would be used only as part of this platform, okay, Cupid, not necessarily that it would be released in a more useful form for analysis by just anybody. Um, so I think um, here's a, a kind of Twitter conversation with a critic um, who said the data set is highly re-identifiable, even includes usernames, was any work done to anonymize it? And uh, one of the researchers said, no, the data is already public. We didn't have to do any of this. So a question that I don't necessarily intend to answer in this video, but one I'd like to put in your heads here is that in analysis of data that individuals willingly shared publicly on a given platform, so perhaps social media, you know, think about what you willingly share on social media. How do you make sure that you don't violate reasonable expectations of privacy? And what is the definition of reasonable expectation of privacy? Um, how much of that should be governed by the law versus how much of that should be left to the ethics versus both? Um, so when we think about data that is available to us at our fingertips, that amount is already very high. And that amount increases greatly as your computational abilities increase as well. We've taught you uh, ways of getting data off the web. So you could be also doing this sort of information gathering, harvesting, scraping of the web. But should you be doing it given um, where, you know, does the answer to the question, should you scrape the data, vary depending on where, what the data is about? And my answer would be yes, it should. And then how, and how do you actually make sure you don't violate reasonable expectations of privacy? This is the sort of question you wanna have in the back of your mind, especially when you're working with human data. And the last case study that I'll touch very briefly on, but I have included a video that I would recommend that you watch uh, immediately after this video is on the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal, if you will. So here is a kind of a um, infographic about uh, what happened there uh, from back in, uh, this was published in The Guardian in 2018. Um, in an article called How Cambridge Analytica Turned Facebook Likes into a Lucrative Political Tool. So what happened is that approximately 320,000 U.S. voters, so they were called CEDARS, were paid uh, 2 to $5 to take a detailed personality political test that required them to log in with their Facebook account. So this is one of those, you know, take a quiz about your personality things. And the app also collected data such as likes and personal information from the test takers personal account, which probably, you know, was said to them as they were logging on. But this is one of these things you just say, OK, fine, let me log on. And it also grabbed their friends data as well amounting to over 50 million people's raw Facebook data. So if I had taken the survey, um, even if you might not have, but we were Facebook friends, information about you would have been uh, accessed as well. And the personality quiz results were paired with their Facebook data, such as likes to seek out psychological patterns. And ultimately, algorithms combine the data with other sources, such as voter records, to create a superior set of records. So initially, 2 million people in 11 key states. Uh, so key states in the United States, meaning the vote could kind of go either way, depending on who votes and how much, uh, with hundreds of data points per person. And so these individuals could then be targeted with highly personalized advertising based on their personality data. In a way, this is a great engineering feat, right? And also, uh, uh, if you think about the design of this, um, you might be thinking, well, you know, they really did get as much data as they could. But the methods by which they got it were certainly deemed unethical um, because uh, people did not, first of all, people did not realize that this is how their data was going to be used. And then the fact that this was all, you know, this was presented as a personality test that also then leaked information about your Facebook friends. Um, this whole thing is kind of um, questionable ethics all around um, in the whole story that ended up being uh, at the time an effective uh, tool.
So uh, in the next video that I have um, listed in the sequence for this week is a, um, a interview that the Guardian did with uh, one of uh, with a data scientist at Cambridge Analytica, where they described exactly how this all took place.